Hey, deserving listeners. Today we have a special guest with us, Fiona O'Farrell, who is a faculty at Antioch University with me in the Couple and Family Therapy Program. And she's here to talk about sexuality and about uh, sex therapy in general and about um, just all sorts of things with regards to that. Uh, the reason why I was inspired to ask her to be on the podcast was because we were at an open house the other night and a bunch of prospective students were coming to the university to ask about the program and uh, the faculty were answering questions for these prospective uh, students and people were asking about sexuality and Fiona had such wonderful answers that I thought, man, you know, we should have her on the podcast. This is, this is, I wish I had a microphone at the time because I was like, this is gold already. <laughs> So um, having said that, Fiona has, has told me she's terrified and nervous right now. Uh, so maybe it'll all come out weird and like this will just be a big disaster. Welcome to the podcast, Fiona. Thanks, Kirk. Would you like to introduce yourself, like your, where your career is, where, where you've been in life? Sure. Um, so uh, as you said, uh, my name is Fiona O'Farrell and I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist here in Washington and I teach at Antioch University. Then I also see couples in my private practice in Wallingford and I have been doing this for about six years um, and been in private practice since 2013 and have been teaching here and there in different capacities since 2015. Um, and I really got interested in sexuality and sex therapy actually in my master's program, but started getting additional training and focusing on that primarily um, probably about four years ago. You graduated from where? Uh, Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma. PLU. And mm -hmm. you, when, what year did you graduate? 2012. With your master's. Yep, in marriage and family therapy. And mm -hmm. you started teaching at Bastier as an adjunct. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and you did your internship with a friend of mine, Roy, at Navos. Great guy. And you taught some classes, I believe, with Roy. Did you not? Oh, well, when I taught at Bastier, uh, one of the components I would try and encourage students to understand about systems was looking beyond just nuclear family to kind of the community systems that folks are embedded in. And so Roy would come in and talk about his mentoring program and then also kind of those approaches that okay. he would kind of, that he kind of lives in. Cool. So Roy and I go way back. I, he might've graduated a similar time that I did. And um, we've been to trainings together and, and, and I've, we've supervised people together. And so when Antioch, started to, to balloon in terms of recruitment or uh, enrollment in the last uh, year, I, there was upper management said, you're free to hire five to 10 new faculty, which is insane because when I first started uh, full time 10 years ago, there was just really three and a half full time people, uh, maybe four. Anyway, so to have like now it's just anyway so we're i was sort of panic i was program director at the time i was sort of panicking about like how do i find people that i can trust because i through experience have learned that hiring a fellow co-workers faculty in particular because faculty are a weird bunch you know what i mean <laughs> like uh, i'm just guessing like accountants and those kinds of people like it's not such a risk but faculty self-included are like massively narcissistic and self-important and don't like to be told what to do and if something's weird about one's personality as a faculty it'll it'll become annoying as a coworker. and so i was real nervous and so i started i didn't want to just put out a blanket you know call for resumes because it's just like how do you know that person isn't going to be insane you know they could have wonderful and i actually on this tangent i've been a part of hiring committees at antioch before in the early to mid aughts and and I actually was on a committee that wholeheartedly hired someone that ended up being a disaster for many years later. <laughs> um, that person no longer works at Antioch, so I, I can say that. But so I've so I've been burnt. So I reached. So I started thinking, okay, who do I know that I can depend on that I think would be great that I know is not crazy? 
Roy was one of the people on my list. And so I called him up and I really hit him hard with it, you know? And I was just like, you know, I think you'd be great. And he's like, well, I don't know. It was, you know, it was sort of a tough time in my life, sort of busy with other things. And, and let me think about it. I was like, okay. And then, you know, a couple weeks later, hey, Roy, what's up? You know, come on, let's do this. You know, and he's just like, ah, I don't think it's going to work. And, and, he, and, he, and I was like, well, do you know of anyone? And he said, well, Fiona is a wonderful instructor and very smart and totally knows her stuff. And I've seen her teach classes. So that must have been from Bastier. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, well, Roy, I, I need to, I need you to be very straight with me here. Cause and I probably told him the whole spiel about, you know, hiring. And I said, you got to tell me, is there any, is she crazy? Is there something <laughs> weird about her? You know, is there anything that I should know about, you know, because if I hire her and a couple years down the line, she ends up driving me nuts. I'm coming after you, pal. And he's like, you'll, nothing will happen. She's totally cool and easy to work with and, you know, fun person. And, you know, no, there's, there's nothing there's without any reservation. So, um, so then we hired you and, uh, I learned you're totally crazy and really annoying to work with. Just joking. Hi. Just joking. No, you're you're great. Uh, totally relaxed. I get no vibe of insanity or uh, pressure or upsetness or unbalance or anything. You know, you're just easygoing but hardworking and you have opinions, but it doesn't, you know, you don't pose them on other people. You, you say things, but you're not going to, I don't know. There's just a vibe I get from people that I, I much appreciate from you, Fiona. Now, maybe your whole, maybe there's something deep inside of you that has yet to emerge, but um, I haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> so, so, uh, and I suspect that if you wanted that big things are available to you at Antioch in the future in terms of becoming a major player because you know right now we have a whole slew of new faculty that in five years will be the veterans mm -hmm. and i think you could be part of that you know group uh, is that i don't know i don't want to put you on the spot but is that part of your plan well this is my third quarter teaching so uh I still call it the honeymoon period. Yeah. But uh, so far, yeah. I I really like that idea. I think that's kind of the plan. Yeah. Without really knowing the plan. Yeah. Who can? Um, I can. It's, um, it's just it's, I've been to a lot of meetings and I've had a lot of experience because a big part of our job is administration. Mm -hmm. You know, we teach, but half of our job is all the other stuff, and. And I can tell in, in you that you have the ability to administrate and to work with other people and be organized and collaborate and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, if you wanted that, I'm guessing it's available to you. Anyway, so let's talk about the uh, planning. We're in the planning phase of a sexual sex therapy concentration. Mm -hmm. That will be within the marriage and family therapy program, but will be available to everyone in the psych program, whether you're CMHC or art therapy or even in the PsyD or PhD programs. Mm -hmm. And for alumni, they can come back to uh, take these classes. Can you tell us tell us about the development of that? It's not it's not being offered currently as of uh, April 2018, but it, it, the plan is to have it offered sometime in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So currently, I really cannot say exactly when it will be available, but, you know, we're moving forward with putting everything together to make it happen. And the idea is, is that um, anybody who comes in who uh, would, you know, are getting their master's in some kind of counseling at Antioch is that they have the choice to concentrate specifically on sex and intimacy. Um, so a few things to kind of talk about is, uh, you know, why this is kind of going to be offered beyond CFT is because this focus is a lot more than just intimacy work with couples, even though that's a component of it, uh, is that this would be working with anybody who identifies as LGBTQ and, you know, the whole spectrum of that community. Um, this is working with folks who have experienced any kind of adverse sexual experiences in their youth. Maybe they have trauma. 
Um, this could be something as simple as um, folks who have had some kind of medical issue or accident that has changed the way that their body functions and alters their ability to be a sexual person in the way that they want to be. So it's this really big range. Um, and so it can be something like what I do, which is working primarily with couples and working on their intimacy and their own identity individual identity about sexuality, but it could be something like somebody maybe who wants a degree in, um, from the CMHC department or an art therapy who are looking to work with individuals around their own sexuality. Yeah. A lot of people are suffering in our society with issues regarding sexuality as you're talking about, and they are seeking therapy or n not but suffering, and a lot of clinicians don't know much about it and and don't feel competent in it or something, mm -hmm. um, or have very backward ideas about it, oppressive, marginalizing ideas. And, uh, you know, I've had clients come to... I, I've become more educated in the kink community, poly community, sex-positive community. I wasn't originally, but over time just in the connections that I've made I've just been like oh and then I've I've been in someone's database they're they have a literal flip what do you call it the card flip mm -hmm. card what do you call this thing Rolodex Rolodex yeah of uh of therapists who are poly and kink friendly and uh, I have clients come to me uh through that venue and they'll say yeah I went to this other therapist and they uh, were really shaming about my BDSM uh, preference or lifestyle or whatever. And it's just really a shame, you know, that us therapists think of ourselves as uh, knowledgeable, mm -hmm. non-shaming, understanding culture, uh, understanding marginalized groups, understanding how to uh, react to things. And like so many therapists just, um, you know, f uh, f probably as a result of ignorance, just don't even know that it's a question mark. Do you, mm -hmm. do you run into that sometimes? Definitely. I would say that kind of a, a few things contribute to therapists, um, either just complete lack of knowledge um, or uh, actual fear of working within this realm. Um, one is that, you know, we train therapists to work within their scope of practice. And uh, you really just don't get a lot of training around working with sexuality. And so, uh, lots of therapists just stay very, very far away from it because they say, I didn't get enough training in this. And so I don't even think that this is something I can go near because I just don't feel competent myself. And then we have kind of the scenario that you're talking about, which is um, encountering uh, sexual identities, orientations, all sorts of things that are just kind of until you know, <laughs> you know, now, Kirk, I, I think you now now that you know, it's everywhere. Right. Um, but uh, until you know, and it seems like such a foreign idea to you, or um, is that the kind of most common mistakes is that therapists can attribute the problems that people are coming in with to their um, identity as being uh, kink friendly or BDSM or are having a, you know, non monogamous relationship. And um, so part of it is this helping. It's just, it's like a, this beautiful little green flashing light that says, oh, you've got all this stuff going on. And you also have this different alternative lifestyle that I don't really know anything about. So it would make sense to me that those two things go together, right. um, which of course, when we take the cap of sexuality off and we look at all these other areas, it just seems like it's so much easier for therapists to maintain that non-judgmental stance. And so one thing is, of course, is it so personal to therapists as well, this conversation of sexuality and that type of thing. And we have very recently in our society, the last you know, 20 to 30 years have been a very sex shaming society. And so if you're not really aware yourself and have kind of your own things to figure out, that shows up big time, of course, when you have clients coming in with things that might just feel very outside of your scope, but also outside of your personal knowledge and awareness. Right. So I, I have two thoughts in general about the therapists who will say, I don't know much about that, to whatever the topic is, and so I'm going to refer or I'm just not going to talk with my clients about that. On one level, it's like, yeah, absolutely. If, if you're not competent, don't dive into something that you don't know anything about. 
But on the other hand, I, I also think like, well, what if all therapists were like that? You know, what if we were all just like, eh, I don't really feel like talking about sex or I don't really feel, I, I don't, I don't feel confident talking about um, homosexuality or um, I don't feel confident talking about conflict in families or something, you know, <laughs> what, or depression. I, yeah. I just, I just, I, I just, you know, what if we all just said that? Like, so on one hand, yes, you should know your limits, but on the other hand, it's like, um, at what point as a professional, is it incumbent on you to become competent to be able to treat the common issues that are present in so many of the clients who are actually sitting on your couch uh, in their lives, uh, particularly couples, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I've ever had a couple who didn't have pretty significant sexuality topics that they would want to talk about. I have a question for you. So early on in my career, I discovered that with couples, most of them would not talk about sex. I wouldn't, if I said, what were the goals? They wouldn't say, I want to talk about sex. A few couples would, but not frequently. And in the beginning of my career, I was just like, oh, well, okay. They didn't bring up sex. They also didn't bring up lots of other things. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to screen for everything. It's just like, what, you know, but over time, like I'd be talking with a couple for like three years and then, and then all of a sudden they'd be like, so they'd mention sexuality mm -hmm. or something would come up. And then, and then after assessing, I would learn that for the entire time they were in treatment with me, they had like this massive problem. Either they weren't having sex at all, or um, one of them had been abused as a child and was experiencing flashbacks of some kind, or there had been infidelity or thoughts of that, or just something, you know, pretty major that they just hadn't brought up and I hadn't thought to ask. And so eventually I just said, I have to ask. And so I would ask couples at some point. Um, sometimes I just sort of drop it in if they've run out of things to talk about. Cause a lot of couples come in and they're, they're in crisis. Mm -hmm. There's huge conflict. They're about to divorce. Mm -hmm. So we got to get through that phase. And then at a certain point they might come in and be like, Oh, well, you know, we've had a pretty good week and I'll be like, okay, well, um, anything you want to talk about? And they're like, uh, I don't know. Nothing. They kind of look at each other like, uh, you know, nothing's really coming up. And I say, well, would you like to talk about sexuality or your sex life together? And they'll be like, oh, well, actually, you know, and then there'll just be this whole thing because of our society's weirdness around sex and mm -hmm. shaming and mm -hmm. just the stigma and keep it, keep it private. And um, I mean, even among, in, even in, among the couple themselves, they might have never talked about sexuality with each other, let alone with an outsider like me. Um, so do you find that to be true as well? Definitely. I think, I, well, the tricky thing about this podcast is you can't see how much I'm heavily nodding along with everything that Kirk is saying. Um, but kind of what I encourage and I try to talk to my students about is even if you're, if you're, you know, your specialization or your focus isn't on sexuality, that I actually make sure to ask about it with everybody, whether I'm seeing a couple or an individual in my initial intake. Um, and part of that for me is, is I set the stage that says this is a place that this is something that I believe is a part of who you are and your identity and it's important to you. Um, and so even if my clients are a little squirmy or they're kind of like, well, that's all fine, you know, it at least for me says this is a subject that you don't have to hold off on or that you have to wait until something comes up to bring it up in here. Um, and so that's kind of the, the attitude that I like to approach. The other is, as we know, and there's been some studies done that, um, you know, marriage and family therapists, specifically people who work with couples, uh, we know that sexuality and intimacy is a big piece of what's happening in a relationship. And there's, I, I'm not going to say the percentage because I can't recall from the study. Um, but, something like, I think more than 50% of couples therapists, not only do they not ask about sex, but they never talk about it in any of their sessions right. with couples. And that's very surprising to me. Um, I think we're doing ourselves a disservice as a therapist because you actually get to know a whole bunch when you ask about sex and intimacy. Mm -hmm. um, it can be actually the thing that you know helps you work with this couple in a way that is going to help you understand what's going on between the two of them yeah. or more. Um, I mean, just so many things. And so I think that if you're not asking about that, it's like, I mean, 
I'm a little biased, but my opinion is if you're not asking about sex, it would be the same as not asking about somebody uh, about their family of origin. Like yeah. that's how big of a puzzle piece I believe that is. Yeah. So many things are involved in it. Uh, I mean, at the baseline level, it's extremely uh, bonding, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, that's why you're using the word intimacy, right? It's a, a loving act that bonds people together. Uh, also, every th step of the way it is emblematic of and you know a example of the way in which couples or people love each other and ask for love and receive love um, whether it's actual sex acts or cuddling or um, kissing while you're passing each other in the hallway or something it all those little behaviors of how do I know myself and what I need? H how do I uh, express that in a mm -hmm. bid for attachment and for physical touching of some kind? How do I uh, give that? How does that person receive it? Do they understand what I'm saying? Um, and when they do understand and they reciprocate, how do I take that and how do we cultivate this mm -hmm. how do i how do we value that is all non-verbal a mm -hmm. lot a lot of times and and so important you know cuz i'm guessing for the therapists that don't talk about it they just stick to the verbal stuff you know like and then you said what and then you and then what did you say and then you know it's that's great it's you know, obviously very important but the actual living life of a couple, I think is much more of the prior situation, you mm -hmm. know, and the feelings we get. And, and when I talk with couples about conflict resolution, one of the things that they often land on that really works is, you know, sometimes in the middle of a fight, I just reach over and hold their hand. Mm -hmm. And there's no amount of words or, you know, argument techniques or I statements that can be used that can amount to the intimacy that's experienced through handholding. And and when you grow up in a sex shaming society, religion, family of origin, uh, gender, uh, you know, sexual, you know, sexual orientation, uh, all those things, e anything can throw a wrench in that process and you have a lifetime of having it be traumatizing and difficult and awkward that makes you even less likely to even approach the topic uh, verbally, let alone physically. And you just have a lifetime of pent up energy and sadness and pain. And, um, and who else better to discuss that with than, you know, marriage and family therapists, right? Um, so someone at the open house asked about our attitude about sex workers. Mm -hmm. uh, the prospective student didn't elaborate. That's all they asked. It's like, you know, uh, you claim to be a, a socially just program. What do you think about sex workers? And I threw it to you. I threw the question. Thanks, Kirk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just sort of looked over at you and I was like, well, I bet you Fiona's got something something good to say. And you did. What What was your response to that? Well, you know, this is that moment where I have no idea what I said. I actually can't remember. Uh, well, but... you, 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 you rambled a bit, but yeah. basically you gave a general response, which was, I think, the right one, which is we talk as a program, we are dedicated to social justice for any marginalized group. And sex workers are, are one of those groups that we yeah. recognize. Yeah. Um, and yeah. So that's basically what you said, which I thought, and but you said it much more eloquently and more involved in that. But I remember there being a few run-on sentences involved in there. But I, you know, I um, like I said, I'm relatively new to Antioch, and what I have been drawn to, and what I appreciate so much about the community and the university is the focus and emphasis on social justice. Um, but more so than that, even thinking about the development of this track our concentration is one thing that will be really important to me as we're moving forward. And this is not just being um, offering a concentration in sexuality, but also being sex positive, which I like to clarify for a lot of people because 
I think that um, often we can confuse sex positivity with sexual progressiveness, and a lot of folks out in the community can have that confusion as well. So I like to identify it as basically everything and anything to do with sex, as long as it's mutually consensual and um, fulfilling to you, is two thumbs up from me or anybody else who has a sex positive attitude. Now, there are some caveats in there. I won't go into those details, but there it is nothing along the lines of you must be sexually progressive in order to be sexual sex positive. And define sexual progressiveness. Um, I'm into BDSM or kink, or I... Um, you know, I I don't do vanilla sex. That's not my thing. I'm much more adventurous than that. So uh, it doesn't matter if you are monogamous, what type of sex you're, you know, encountering in, if you're the most adventurous sexual being out there in the world. Right. Um, all of that is okay as long as it's consensual to you and the people that you're engaging with. Right. Often people who identify as sex positive are also sexually progressive. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and so they often get confused, as you're saying, mm-hmm. which I don't think I'd ever really thought about. Is the sex positivity on the internet is probably associated with BDSM and with open relationships, polyamory. Uh, but that's just because they f- those people focus on sex positivity because they're trying to tell everyone else, look. This is okay. <laughs> yeah, I need yeah, a voice. Yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, uh, heterosexual, married, uh, missionary position, couples don't need to stand up and say sex positivity, you know, it, I mean, although one could argue, uh, there's still shaming around that obviously Definitely. as well, uh, but just less of a need, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. Uh, and the phrase sex positivity kind of, it connotes a progressiveness. Like I'm positive towards, you know, I'm moving, you know, mm-hmm. but it's like, you could be sex positive about um, not having sex at all. You could be asexual. Exactly. You could be the most, you know, like I said, the most uh, vanilla uh, in terms of society's definitions, uh, lifestyle, uh, you know, once a week with your spouse for five minutes or whatever it is. <laughs> and, you know, after the kids are in bed or whatever, and you could also be sex positive. It's, a, it's an attitude. Yeah. It's a it's a non uh, oppressive, non-marginalization, non-harmful viewpoint of other people and um, and of yourself, because and 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 how strange it is that we need to have such a statement, and how strange it is that it's so foreign, right? Mm-hmm. The idea that look, when you see another sexual act or you hear about some other sexual thing, just because it grosses you out doesn't mean it's immoral or wrong or laughable. Mm-hmm. Uh, you need to evaluate it on, is it harming anyone? Is it consensual? Because uh, if it's not harming anyone and it's consensual, and you know, like you said, there's some caveats there, but in general, uh, then you, to me, not only do you have a, not only do you not have a right to criticize it, but you actually, um, any kind of negative thought you have towards it, I, I consider it to be immoral. Like, it, it to me, it's like looking at a black person and, and oh, I have a secret thought that that black person is evil or stupid or something. It's like that, that's not okay, I don't think. Uh, the, and, and it's like, why would you have those points of view? Like, I get that you have that knee jerk reaction based on your programming in society, but you know, we're all adults now and we should be able to kind of think this stuff mm-hmm. through a little bit, mm-hmm. you know. And it's and you know, sexuality is so innocent, it's just like someone likes to look at that kind of weird kind of porn and that that's what they like to do. Like let it go. Like what, but we've been taught from a very early age to just laugh at people, ah, dumb or crazy or icky or evil or immoral or something. It's just like so much weirdness around that, you know? Yeah. And so I'm thinking of a couple of things, one coming full circle to kind of that question that was thrown out at the um, info night was around sex work is that, of course, you know, is a sex positive attitude about it, which is, again, is anybody being harmed? Is it consensual? Is it um, something, is it a choice versus, you know, something that's been forced upon you? Then uh, I think that you know, hopefully I would speak of, you know, representing our university is that is the approach we take kind of on all walks of life, on all fronts. Um, Then the other is thinking about that. And I think something, again, that I see in my work a lot, that's also, you know, something that's been interesting to teach about uh, is kind of how layered this is because sexuality, again, in our culture, 
which I'm going to identify as tends to be sex shaming, um, is so hidden. So it's like that piece around um, finding out what kind of porn somebody's into. Uh, it's not like we wear T-shirts saying like, oh, I like this type of porn. Um, and so there's that kind of secrecy that's already just like exists inherently around sexuality. Yeah. Um, and so then it's when it gets you know, discovered or it's a use as an identifier, um, where people are making judgments, where there is shame, where there is oppression. Um, it, it's like, it has just that much more, um, intensity and impact on our clients and on everybody because it's something that they've kind of held so close to themselves. Yeah. It's, and it's so pervasive. I, I, I mean, well, just, just to get a little bit on the sex work thing, there's people out there listening that are like, well, aren't all sex workers slaves? Aren't they all being coerced into it, beaten into it? And certainly there are, but there are people who are not. There are people who, I know people who absolutely came from a privileged background, were completely free, had nobody influence them. And, and at some point in their life, they're just like, I think I want to try it. I want to try sex work. And mm-hmm. and they did. Uh, one, of, one of my friends found it, uh, she didn't like it very much, but it wasn't a horrible experience. And she, she actually asked her, I was like, so what was the pimp like? What was, you know, what was the, what was that whole thing like? And, and she was like, they were all really nice people. Like everyone was really nice. <laughs> you know, <laughs> my fellow sex workers were nice. My quote unquote boss was nice. The clients were nice. The clients were really nice. Uh, I, everything was just nice, but I, I just, I don't know. It just wasn't for me. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was like, man, what a stereotype breaker. That one was, you know, but anyway, uh, along the lines of shaming people, you know, I don't know the specific story, but Donald Trump, there's a story about him urinating on someone or something, right? And it's, and of course, you know, Democrats around the country, shame that it's a terrible thing, gross, you know, but to me, it's like, if you really look at it a lot, I don't know the details, you know, maybe this, maybe that particular person didn't want that to happen. I don't know. But unless we know for sure that the recipient of the urine, even if this happened, we don't know, of course, you know, in this yes. today's world, God knows. But anyway, if it did happen and the other person was cool with it or cool with it on the level of I'm getting paid $10,000 for this, then why are we shaming that? Mm-hmm. You know, like mm-hmm. you'll let him have, you know, maybe his wife even signed off on it and said like, you know, now again, who knows? It, it could go completely other direction, but just based... The, the headline for this for people in our you know in the liberal world is Donald Trump's a scumbag he peed on a he peed on a woman I, I consider that to be another example of sex shaming yes you know when it comes to opportunities for what's happening in the political climate in our country and all sorts of things is I think that there's going to be a lot of opportunities taken at any uh, example of, of something that, again, could by some people be considered gross or not okay. And to me, again, that's more of their own uncomfortability around a sex act or behavior that is actually, you know, again, hypothetically, the two people involved get to identify whether something's gross or not. Uh, nobody else. Right. And, um, and so, you know, I look back and, um, think about kind of the platforms and the um, statements that were made before uh, we legalized gay marriage in the country and just the really, really kind of concrete um, inflexible statements made about, you know, same sex couples or those types of things. And of course, I live in the Seattle bubble, so it's easy for me to say this. But now I look at kind of the attitudes and opinions of many people um, that have shifted significantly since that was passed and how just a statement like that wouldn't even fly um, because it, it wouldn't have the same leverage. So you, you have a hope that it will change for other things as well? Like your nation on somebody else? You're right. Yeah, Perhaps. maybe. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I just can't see it. But I couldn't, <laughs> in the 80s, I couldn't see people in other areas being positive about gay marriage either. So, uh, so you know, maybe. Mm-hmm. We can only hope that one day people will be able to pee on each, on each other and without, and they could go to work the next day and say like, so Bill, how was your weekend? And Bill can say, well, you know, I had some good sex. We peed on each other. It was great. You know, yeah. how was your weekend? Oh, you know, missionary. It was fine. Yeah. You know, that, that's, <laughs> that's the example I always come up with in terms of like, uh, as a litmus test for everyone in terms of 
understanding how weird our culture is around sex. And tell me if this analogy makes sense to you. Okay. Is like you go to work on Monday and someone asks you how your weekend went and say you went on a hike and you're like, oh, I went on a hike. And the person, oh, great. What was it like? Oh, well, we hiked up Mount Rainier and it was great. Well, you know, was it cold? Oh, yeah, it was real cold. Um, okay, totally normal conversation. Um, or even better yet, another analogy I use is, um, so how was your day yesterday? Oh, man, I went to the spa and... I, you know, went to the, I went to the pools and then I had this massage, I had a two hour massage. Um, was it one of those naked massages? Yeah, you get naked, but you know, you have, you're under a sheet and everything's fine. Um, for two hours, man, that must've been really great. Another human being is touching you this entire time and you know, you know, all over, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, you could totally say that at, at work on Monday. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had massages and had that conversation. I've had massages in the middle of the day at work and said, I just had a massage. It was <laughs> you know? great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, scenario uh, three, someone comes to work and they had amazing sex the weekend. You know, they had, they had like, you know, I don't know, 10 sessions of sex that weekend and it was just amazing. Or they had a sex retreat or I don't know, whatever the case is. You, or, Those exist, by yeah. the way. Or yeah. just <laughs> one event of sexuality totally. that was nice. And um, just even, again, heterosexual, vanilla, missionary position, whatever. Um, how many people are going to say to acquaintances at work, um, man, had the best sex of my life last night with, with my spouse. It was just amazing. Um, really? How, how'd it go? Oh, well, it started like this and it ended, the middle was, it ended like this and it was great. Um, man, you know, was it cold? You know, like mm -hmm. what, what it sounds yeah. kind of, you know, or was it hot? Where did you get sweaty? Like, like there are quite, there's just like that conversation would never happen. Right? Yeah, actually, I, I, I'm going to roll with your analogy a little bit and say, what if we take the spa scenario and say, well, you know, my partner and I, we um, rented this place, we got naked, went into, they had a pool and a hot tub and a sauna and took time going in between there. And then we took two hours to give each other massages and then it ended in great sex. Yeah. Also something you would never say. Right. But if it's in a spa with a masseuse. Right. You know, yeah. then totally fine. So, yeah, there's this huge, yeah. there's, somehow there's this huge divider line between hiking and spas and massages and having just a normal sexual activity that everyone assumes is happening, happening. for every couple, yep. you know what I mean? And yet to mention it would just be shocking. Mm -hmm. I imagine you'd get written up with HR. Prob well, probably, and that's that's where some of this always goes, right? Is um, and it happens whether we're talking about at workplace scenarios or in therapy. Is this is a subject area where there are many lines that can be crossed depending on who you're talking to or whatever. And so instead of us figuring out the nuances of that line and and learning how to have these conversations, we just say don't touch it. Right. Go like stay far, far away. Right. Um, which is, you know, this is a topic for a different time, but also the conundrum we're being faced with right now with the discussion of sexual harassment in the workplace is I am not advocating for that in any way, shape or means, but what I like to n normalize, I'm putting quotations up sexual pleasure and activity as much as possible. Yes. The example that I give, and I'm, I'm wondering if I want to do this because it's actually a, a, something I do in one of my classes is I ask people to list out all the things they do for self-care. And then I say, well, is sex on there? And they're yeah. like, oh, no, well, that goes somewhere else, right. you know? And I'm like, why wouldn't it be? And I'm not talking about even it can be solo sex, right? Like this right. doesn't have to be something, you know, because every once in a while I'll get... Uh, somebody who's like, well, I'm single. I can't even put it on my list. And I, so that's the other conversation is, is this is more than just sex that you have with another person. Right. Sex is lots of different things and it can take many shapes and um, it, it's a pleasurable, caring activity. Right. Yeah. Anyone who, well, many people, if they really were being honest, would say, you know, to put it bluntly, masturbation is a thing I do for self-care. And how many people would be able to admit that? You know, liberal, open-minded, sex-positive therapists, how many of them would be able to 
even among a small group of fellow, you know, accepting people, be able to say such a thing, you know, yeah. because of our deep programming around how shameful it is on so many levels. Not only is sex just shameful to begin with, but self sex is just like, whoa, like what's wrong with you? That's that's what for thirteen year olds like now. Plenty of adults don't masturbate, you know, it's, you know, whatever. But again, lots of people do. And what's all this weirdness around it? We're, to me, it's like we're all 12 year olds walking around and we just never grew <laughs> up. You know what I mean? Like, hee hee, yeah. Donald Trump peed on somebody. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just like we just can't take it. You know, everything's just so um, uh, giggly, you know. In your classes with your students, do you have to kind of go with the giggles? You know, I try to set up the tone pretty early from the beginning, but um, I think humor, as long as it's used appropriately, also helps people settle in and get a lot more comfortable. So it's it's kind of, you know, a little bit of both is I... I don't think class would be as successful if it's just like, you know, giggles all over the place. But I do talk about um, actually more, you know, when we look at sexually explicit content or anything like that, is that there can be a lot of blushing and um, less eye contact and that type of thing among the group and identifying too that, um, you know, if you have any kind of response to anything that you're seeing or what we're talking about, it's not because you're creepy or that this isn't okay. It's because you're a human being and you have sexual responses because that's how you were made. Yeah. Um, and like kind of just throwing out that every once in a while, like that might happen with what we're talking about. And that doesn't indicate anything about you except for the fact that you, the way you were designed seems to be working pretty well. So, yeah, I haven't seen you teach this class, but I've seen other people. And the thing that I marvel at is the ability for the instructors to model essentially a vibe a, a a way of being you, you know you're not just teaching a subject you're you're modeling how to discuss things how to occasionally have humor about it but there are certain humors that you might have an impulse about particularly culturally that you don't want to engage in mm-hmm. you know like ha 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 that person has a small penis ha 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 you know what i mean like there's an impulse for that but it's like well that humor even though that's a thing that'll make people laugh no you know but humor around like, I don't know, just, I don't know how to, you know, just other kinds of giggles, I suppose, um, uh, are, are perhaps not harmful. Mm-hmm. I'm having a hard time coming. Do you have an example of a giggle that wouldn't be um, harmful to people? Well, I, uh, the first one that comes to mind is uh, when I'm asking my clients to tell me more about what happens with sex between them, I say, I want details. And yeah. then I kind of go, but not all the details, yeah. you know, and we and we all kind of like giggle about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, and it usually seems to put people at ease. And I think that's where, um, I think this is also like therapist to therapist. If you're good and you understand how to use humor again in an appropriate way, it's a great way to help your clients feel comfortable talking about sexuality. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, it's that fine line, which is... Uh, I think something that comes with experience, but also um, it might also just be, you know, based on the person's ability to kind of execute that. Yeah. I want to take a break and we get back. Let's continue this. What do you say? Okay. All right. We're back with Psychology in Seattle with our special guest, Fiona O'Farrell, who is a, an instructor at Antioch University in my program, Couple and Family Therapy. She's also a practicing couples therapist in Wallingford. Where's your office in Wallingford? It is just two blocks up from Gasworks Park. So it's okay. on 34th and Meridian, basically. Okay, so down by the water. Mm-hmm. And do you have a view? I have a pretty good view. Wow. Yep. Of Lake Washington, Space I get, Needle. Uh, or basically, Lake, I get Lake the Union. U Bridge to the Ballard Bridge. Wow. So, looks pretty good. That's mm-hmm. pretty great. Um, and okay, and you're starting at some point, unknown exactly start date for the sexual, what's it going to be called? We're going to, right now, it's called the Sex and Intimacy Track. Um, and 
the nice thing is, is courses that would fall under this are already being offered. So we're already offering um, classes that have to do with working with different gender identities, um, sexual orientation, a sex therapy specific class. So all of these are available. We're just working on how we package that for people. So it's kind of like a minor in a sense. Yeah. Like you're majoring in couples and family, couple and family therapy, but you're taking a, a like a minor in sexuality and mm-hmm. intimacy. And the idea is, is that, um, and this is where I just don't have enough details about it at this point, um, is that it will be a certificate um, so that alumni can come and take the courses uh, and that it will be um, reflected on your transcripts that you have this uh, master's in, MF, or in couple and family therapy, but then you have a certificate in sex and intimacy. Which is different than being a certified sex therapist. Yes. Yeah. And you actually fielded a, a question about, or I threw to you when someone asked about uh, what about becoming a certified sex therapist? And, and then uh, you said something really great. What did you, you say to that? So, um, so there's a few things to identify, which is that right now, except in the state of Florida, anybody can identify themselves as a sex therapist. There's no protection over that identification. Um, but there is a national association. It's called the Association American Association for Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. Um, otherwise known as ASECT, and they have a certification process and standard, which is basically the kind of gold standard and the most kind of highly regarded in the country. Um, And that is what most people, when they identify as a certified sex therapist, it means they meet those standards from ASECT. And it's pretty involved. It's, It's like a mini master's degree. Yeah, it's uh, very rigorous. It's um, 90 hours of CEUs, 60 additional in sex, sexuality and sex therapy. So an hour of CEU is just an hour, an hour. of class? Mm-hmm. Oh, so only 90. Plus 60. Plus 60, in, but yeah. still 150 hours of, of class time. And then the kind of more rigorous work is the hours you need to get doing sex therapy itself. Su- um, supervised by... A, yes. a certified ASECT person. And then supervised by an ASECT oh, person. That's, that's so. a lot less than I thought. Because when I read the, I, I misunderstood, and I think I talked about this in a previous podcast, I thought it was 90 hours of course, like graduate coursework. Yes. So if you hold, so th- this is where it's interesting, is if you you have to have, be a master's level um, therapist to be ASECT certified. Yeah. Um, but the some of that coursework can come from your master's degree. I see. So 150 hours of, or equivalent of some, of uh, different topics in sexuality and mm-hmm. intimacy and, and sex therapy, practices, theory, anatomy, ethics, yes. all that kind yep. of stuff. Um, and typically one day of a full class is like six hours. So... I'm just trying to estimate this out. This would be like 150 divided by six is uh, 25-ish or something. Um, And so it'd be 25 Saturdays. There you go. Of of (laughs) classes. Um, So that's a lot less than an actual full master's degree. Yeah. Um, That's more like, what would that be like? That'd be like, I don't know, like, 15 credits or something i'm guessing ish of of master's level work okay and then and then you're supervised for like a few hundred hours or something or uh fi- actually 50 hours okay and then um i think it's 300 face to or um face to face clinic hours right so like yeah. with after you get your training like you can't have counted hours prior to getting a exactly training. It's quite rigorous and the standard is pretty high. And the most important thing to, and I'm an ASECT member and I consider myself a part of the community. Um, but you're not a certified sex therapist no, according not yet. to mm-hmm. ASECT. Yeah. yeah. Why? I mean, because you're already doing sex therapy. Like, what's the point? Because I actually want to support the ideas that we talked about at the beginning of the show, which is um, that 
there's got to be something in between not doing it at all and having this be your specialization. Now, this is my passion and my focus. So of course, I want to have it as my specialization. I like being a part of the community and I like having kind of the standardization of the certification. And I really would like it if more people out in the community were incorporating sexuality into their work. So I don't think everybody needs to go for it. Um, uh, that, yeah, I guess yeah. it's your passion and professionally. And so it would make sense that you would seek it. It's like if somebody really wanted to be an EFT therapist, like, of course, they can go ahead and you know, read some books and do one of the, some of the trainings and incorporate it, but they like being a part of the kind of professional community and having the rigor. Yeah. And that's how I feel about ASECT. Yeah. What do you think about sex therapists who look at uncertified sex therapists and say that they shouldn't be talking about sex with their clients? When I see somebody who identifies as a sex therapist but is not a sex certified, I am just curious to know what their background is in identifying that way. So I think there are a lot of people who probably have um, good training or have focus or work with maybe just experience. They've worked with specific populations for a long time um, that would identify that way. Uh, but for me, that's I, w I would like to see just how they've landed there. What is it about the work that they do that um, helps them identify in that way? In Florida, can marriage and family therapists provide sex therapy things or are they banned from doing that in that state? Well, at, I do not practice in the state of Florida, so I don't know too many details about this. What's confusing is... is um, if you get a degree and you hold a license in couple and family therapy in whatever state you're in, we are specifically trained in working with couples and inherently working with couples, you should be asking about sex. Um, so I believe that there's that component where you can be working with couples and you ask and incorporate sex. I don't know the specifics in Florida of whether or not you can identify as a sex therapist without having the um well, not identify, but because that would, I'm guessing, be part of it. And that's always what happens uh, is that as professions become legally licensed, they get legal monopoly on certain terms. You know, psychologists, um, even us as therapists, mm -hmm. like uh, in Washington State, you can't call yourself a counselor or a therapist a, a, without being a licensed person of, of you know, master's level. Uh, in the past, you could. You could be a psychotherapist without even a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I'm just guessing that over time, as this becomes more professionalized, uh, that in every state there will be some recognition around the certification and what is allowed to be advertised or discussed. But the, the thing, so the identification is one thing, but because there's a lot of topics like this, like, I have never taken a class on art therapy, but I have used art in therapy. Mm -hmm. I have never taken a class on play therapy, but I have used a ton of play in therapy. <laughs> I've never taken a class on sex therapy. I've taken some courses on sexuality, but you know, not really anything on sex therapy. And I have talked about sex with so many clients. I've never taken a class, what are the other sort of specialized areas? Drama, I've never taken a drama therapy class and I've used uh, drama therapy techniques, but mm -hmm. I don't call them drama therapy techniques, I call them family therapy te techniques. Mm -hmm. Virginia Satir was using those all the time. Um, so uh, I'm just wondering where it's headed because every profession tries to eke out um, resources and tries to say that we deserve these resources. and. So I'm just wondering if ASECT is headed towards trying to get a monopoly on that, you know, and, and to say like, look, just because you have a marriage and family therapy degree doesn't mean that you're competent talking with your clients about sex. Therefore, you shouldn't be talking with your clients about sex. Um, well, I, you know, disclaimer, I don't represent ASECT. Right. Um, so from what I know about being a member of the community, is that uh, they want to promote a better understanding of healthy sexuality, and I'll say healthy in quotations again, um, 
across the board. And I, I don't think they're heading in the direction of not allowing people to incorporate sex into their work if they're not certified. I do think that they are trying to help recognition that the certification is kind of very rigorous and of a very high standard right. and that people who are seeking out um, therapy services, that it might help them out to find an ASEC certified therapist. Right. Um, something I talk about with my students is because I don't want my students graduating and feel like they can't ask about sex, just kind of like what you're identifying or they can't you know, use sexuality in their work. Even is, though they're not ASEC certified. Exactly. Is I want us to have a better understanding of actually how to collaborate within our fields, right? So if you're an MFT who does not hold sex therapy certification, but you work with a lot of couples or individuals and ask about sex a lot, I think it would be really great to know where you reach the point working with a particular client where somebody who does have certification might be a great referral for you mm -hmm. or a collaboration. Okay. Um, so that's kind of what I want to promote is knowing where those edges are mm -hmm. and helping people to be practicing competently, confidently, and also so that they know the other people in their community who are certified that they can use as a resource and also refer to. Yeah, absolutely. And there could be and could be and there probably are uh, marriage and family therapists who are not certified a sex, sex therapists who are perhaps some of the best sex therapists who have ever lived. Totally. You know what I mean? So, and the reverse is true that you can have a sex certified people who are terrible, you know? Um, it's less likely, but, Hopefully. but, uh, but possible because the, the analogy to this is I've talked with the play therapy association in the United States. And, um, because I, I can't remember how I went down this road, but, Somehow someone was accusing me or someone else of saying that unless you're a certified play therapist, you don't know what you're doing with play. And I organically learned play therapy. I took, I didn't even, I kind of knew about the field in the mid nineties when I took, when I was in my master's program, but, but very, very peripherally for the most part, I just haphazardly learned how, and I, not to brag, but I became very good at play therapy, uh, pretty much out of necessity. I mean, you, t you talk with anyone younger than 13 and, you know, it's pretty much all you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I guess I just used my intuition based on my ideas of healing and processing things that you can do a lot through play. And eventually I figured out, like, you could you could talk about something without ever talking about it with a client through play. You know, you have a five-year-old who is playing with dinosaurs and stuff, and, and and you never know for sure what they're working out. But it's like, I think they're working on their dad right now. I'm not sure, but I'll participate in this and create a space for them to, you know, see where it goes. And and um, and then 20 years later, I learned that's a whole field. That's a, that's a whole psychodynamic or Rogerian style of, of play therapy. And I can't remember what it was, but someone was saying, like, um, well, you know, you're not a certified th play therapist. You shouldn't be doing it. And I was just like, that is absurd to, to think that, I mean, maybe I'm completely ignorant, but I just can't imagine like if um, that if I went back to school for play therapy, that somehow I'd find out all this brand new information. I probably learned theory and all that kind of stuff, which is interesting. And I have, I've read books and whatnot. But anyway, my point is, is that um, I reached out to the play therapy association so the general, the general public, there were people who were like, if you're not a certified play therapist, you can't do play therapy. So I reached out to the association, like the president and all those people. And, and they said exactly what you're saying, which is that, no, there are, there are some people who, are, who have never taken a class in play therapy or some of the best play therapists who have ever lived. Um, and you have some people who are certified play therapists who are terrible at play therapy. But, uh, but having the certification is one way to at least gain competence mm -hmm. and also to uh, for, for the public to recognize oh this person isn't just saying something they actually went through something whereas me so you take me and i say i'm really good at play therapy it's like we'll prove it i was like well 
I've had a lot of success with clients. Like they just don't have any way to know. Yeah. But a certified play therapist says, I'm really good at play therapy. And I'm also a certified play therapist, which means blah, blah, blah. They're just more convincing, you know, um, and uh, less prone to narcissism or something around like, well, I know what I'm doing and I, I don't mm -hmm. need to learn anything or something. Um, or at least the idea is, is that that's, that's the truth. So am I describing that? Yeah, I, I would agree with you on everything you're lining up with. I think the thing that keeps coming to my mind is, again, what we talked about at the beginning, which is how damaging bad sex therapy can be yeah. um, or kind of incompetent, that type of thing. So we kind of talked about the circumstance of maybe somebody identifying um, an orientation or identity is not okay or maybe the source of the problem. The other things I'm thinking about are like conversion therapy yeah. or, you know, um, different treatments for a sexual compulsivity or addiction. And um, that, you know, that the outcomes of that can be really detrimental to folks. Right. Um, and so there is there is kind of that other component, right, which is... Um, well, in general, those are becoming illegal. Yes. And two, they are, uh, in general, very much frowned upon in training programs, even in conservative areas. So you would be practicing outside of the f scope of our field anyway, but yeah, from a consumer side, it's like in the phone book I or on the internet, I find a bunch of people who claim that they do sex therapy. How in the world would you know that that person would actually be not be a horrible person for you? Yeah, uh, it's just hard hard to know, and the certification helps that for mm -hmm. sure. Um, but I just don't see in the future people adding on that whole because there's so many things to add on right you know like if i if i if i added on everything that uh some people would think i should like i'd still i'd, I'd never get out of school play therapy certification sex therapy certification um you know sexual minority certification cultural certification uh it just you know chemical dependency and it's it just um i think the overall thing and then we'll move on is that all of us need to think critically about what we're competent in and, mm -hmm. and what's reasonable in terms of how and in terms of gaining more competence, whether it's through certification tracks or just exposing your like the I through this podcast, I have become m much more aware of polyamory because I've had polyamorous guests and spokespeople who educated me sitting in that chair, you know what I mean? And then I went on to work with clients on in that couch and uh, they educated me. And so now I now I feel very comfortable talking with people about polyamory, even though I don't, I'm not polyamorous myself, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And so, uh, but 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I, w I was similar to everyone else. It's like, how does that work? Like, that can't be right. You know, just a, just a general, you know, upsetness about it and uh, had my paradigm shift. Anyway, so, and never taken a class of polyamory. I take that back. I took one continuing ed that was sort of about polyamory, but anyway. Um, the point is, is that uh, we all need to think critically about what we're competent in, what we should get more education on, when we should refer, when we shouldn't. Um, and, um, and as a field, we need to figure out how to advertise that and protect people and all that kind of stuff. And it gets complicated. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What Kirk said. <laughs> um, so what's it like talking about these subjects with your students? I mean, uh, it's, you know, I just, I, I've never taught a class. I, we ended up having to fire our, uh, I ended up having to fire our, um, sexual minorities, counseling sexual minorities. Did I tell you about this whole thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a disaster. This it was a brand new adjunct, and the instructor had created just a complete cluster F with this class, and it went really badly. Now I wasn't there, so I can't. You know, all I have is the accounts from the students and the instructor, but things fell apart, and we had to we had to fire the instructor halfway through the quarter, and then it was incumbent on me to like somehow teach the rest of the class, and I'm like. Uh, I don't have I don't have time for that, and plus I don't know I don't I don't know, I don't know what the, the students would probably be teaching me about this sort of stuff. So, and I didn't want to change it in one of those classes where it's just like, okay, everyone do presentations, and I'll just sit here and like you know look like an idiot in the back of the room. So um, I did teach one class, but I actually got a bunch of guest speakers who were like 
um, renowned in the area for different topics. And it seemed to pull the class out of the nosedive because the students were threatening to sue the university and like they were wanted their money back, which of course, God knows if the university would ever even do that. I mean, I'd gladly give their money back if it was up to me. Fine, here's your money back, you know, and here's an extra 20 bucks, you know, for your time. But the university doesn't like to do that kind of stuff. Um, but in the time that I was involved, it was, um, I felt myself just like, there's so many landmines, uh, gender pronouns, sexuality, uh, you know, anatomy, uh, you know, especially with the way things are moving, which I think is a good movement, but my brain has not moved yet. It's, yeah. <laughs> I still have a problem calling people they. Like, it's still kind of, it's still a, I want to, I want to not have it be a struggle, but my neurons are just like they. That's that's more than one person. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and uh, referring, you know, how do we language things around like, people with penises, people with vaginas, people with both, people with neither, people who had a penis at one time and now are, you know, like, how do we divorce all that from he and she and, you know, this and that and it and it's and we're still developing all that. And it just seems like that alone has a lot of landmines. And then you have students who have, you know, not necessarily enlightened points of view. And you have discussions at Antioch because we always have lots of discussions. And so students are going to be like, well, I think peeing on people is ridiculous and it's gross and, you know, and da, 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 da. And like, ah, oh, that triggers me, you know, like I, how do you deal with all that? Well, I think it's inevitable one. Um, and so part of it is again, really setting up my classroom in this space, talking about, I mean, a few of the things that I talk about are um, how, you know, terminology, language, all of those things is developing very, very quickly. And um, there's no expectation for me to be completely up to date on all of those terms, because it would be impossible. Um, also that I try to set up an environment where we do learn from one another. So, you know, kind of putting it out there that I don't see myself as the all knowing expert. Um, I see myself as being a resource and having some ideas about some things um, and trying to teach and lend that knowledge to other people, but also inviting a lot of the experience and knowledge from the students. Um, I do think actually having guest speakers and particularly in some of these areas where we're talking about uh, folks who just identify or lead lifestyles that are very, very different from what our students may know um, or our students know very well and have kind of a narrow view of what that is um, because it humanizes the experience for them. It gives them more perspective on what they're going to be encountering um, as they become therapists in the room. Um, and then I, you know, I, I'm really transparent. Um, so I actually had a whoopsies when I taught counseling sexual minorities, which is I, for some reason, thought that um, Washington State had already banned conversion therapy. And it's just the city of Seattle at the time. Of course, now they have banned it and it is illegal. Um, and so I kind of gave this thing on how not practiced here and then, you know, was like, oh, man, I got that very wrong. And we definitely Me have people who practice conversion therapy. Meaning that someone felt hurt that or a f like nope i just gave wrong information oh you, you no one no one came came at <laughs> yeah. you yeah and i think that that's that is where i do feel oh. like i have to do my you know best is to make sure i'm giving accurate information i guess so, um, but. in terms of people feeling kind of hurt or you know maybe i say something that isn't completely is you know we have our evaluation process at antioch but i pretty much do that in every class so one thing that i do is i hand out index cards in my classes that students can um, hold on to and if they ever have something that they feel like was sad or offended them or um, the space got really uncomfortable safety was threatened anything like that they can write it down and hand it to me at the end of the class um, I like to kind of just have my little spidey sense out too and kind of check in on students. And then I do a lot of like zooming in and zooming out. So some of it is just personal stuff where they're kind of reflecting on their own in what probably feels like safer little um, dyads or triads and then inviting the group and just kind of utilizing all of those so nobody gets really used to just one format. Um, and I don't want to jinx it, so I'm not going to say so far 
I've been pretty, I've had such wonderful students. Well, yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, if you have a long and uh, interesting career at Antioch, you'll you'll have your ups and downs. But if anything is going to happen, it's going to be at the beginning, Mm -hmm. especially the first time you teach a class. And the fact that you didn't have any is an indication of a lot of things. One is, to me, just reading between, between the lines of what I know about teaching, is that it's all about the relationship that you have and the and the way it feels to sit as a student in your class. If students are made to feel, you know, hurt or or scared or um, silenced or something, then they will find anything to attack you on. They'll attack you on the way you dress. They'll attack you on your powerpoints. On the other hand, if you make students feel safe, relaxed. Um, flex, like they can move, you know, they can say things, they can, you know, within reason. Um, you can get away with anything in my book. <laughs> you know, you could have terrible PowerPoints. You could even kind of not teach that much. But, <laughs> but, but you could teach a lot and make students feel unsafe and give them a vibe of uh, they're in danger on, on some level. And yeah, they'll find anything. And, and there's always something that you can attack a, an instructor on. You can, there's mm-hmm. always something. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what I find because students will rise up against an instructor. And by the time they get to me, it's been weeks of them being upset and unsafe and talking amongst themselves. And then they come to me and they tell me all their complaints. And none of the complaints make any sense. I'm like, well, a lot of instructors do that, you know? Um, and and so I always have to, I, over time I've learned, it's just a hypothesis based on my experience, is that it began with something that they actually aren't necessarily even aware of, you know, that they can't really put to words or they don't feel like it's relevant. You know, the, the notion of feeling safe isn't something that a lot of students, I think maybe even, even feel they have the right to or something, I don't know which they do in my book. And so you must have made them feel very safe talking about things that are, you know, pretty um, sensitive and made people feel safe enough to express themselves or, you know, like passing out cards and say, I am completely open, you know, please tell me if I've done anything. Just that notion itself is a creation of safety, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, So you must either, you know, know that or just naturally do that so that um, you don't create the the germination of complaints that will rise up and people will attack you for so so roy was right is my point about you um uh we were talking with another instructor about how she had a problem with a student or a student had a problem with her we talked about this. Um, she, she said the word gendered instead of gender. She mm-hmm. she was saying um, that we that's a gendered topic or something. Like, I don't know what they were talking about. So the instructor was saying something along the lines of this. It wasn't this, but something along the lines of this. Well, uh, socialization is gendered. You know, the socialization of children is gendered. And the student was really upset about that. We're hearing this through the instructor, so God knows if this is what actually happened. But um, but just as a, a anecdote of how students and instructors can ha- become at odds or there can be landmines around this stuff. Did that landmine make sense to you? That particular one? Yeah. Um, I think that there's so much uh, that I don't know about that circumstance. I think that's a... A good example also where particular classes, I think students are going to be kind of already feeling unsafe just because of the class. And I know this was the human sexuality course, um, which I will teach this summer. Um, And I think that one in particular is really tough because it is more personal than some of the other classes we teach in the realm of sexuality because it's asking students to do a lot of self kind of um, inspection, understanding, looking at their own messages they were raised with. Um, yeah, it, they basically kind of do a family of origin around sexuality. sexuality. Yeah. yeah, and like the first know, time they thought about sex, the first time they thought about 
uh, the first time they had sex, you know, all that kind of stuff. They write about all mm-hmm. that. Yeah. And, and, you know, the idea is, is so that you confront the things that you may or may not be carrying with you and you're encountering your clients. Um, but I think that class in itself um, is, you know, is exposing people, whether or not it's even talked about in discussion or whatever that is. And so I I don't think that particular discrepancy made all that much sense to me, but I know that the setting of that particular class might be an invitation for more of those landmines than some other other classes. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so anything else you want to talk about about this? I, I, my, I had a bunch of questions, but I'm forgetting what they were. <laughs> Did you have any other things that we didn't get touch on that you wanted to talk about? Um. Not, not that I can think of off the top of my head. So, the, so the, s- the sex and intimacy concentration will include human sexuality, mm-hmm. which all MFT students have to take anyway. Yes, it's a required course. Mm-hmm. It will include a particular courses, or or you you have your choice in the other three courses you take. No, it it will be particular courses. Um, plus, probably we'll have some like special topics that come in and out throughout the years as an elective Uh, as an elective so maybe uh what would be the the other classes that are that are being planned as as required so one we've been talking about a lot which is counseling sexual minorities which we're going to change the title of that class actually what's it going to be called something more like um counseling along the sexual spectrum or uh something like that and the thought is is that we don't want to just focus on quote unquote minorities or even refer to people as minorities. Yeah. It's like the othering that happens by identifying minority for that class. Um, And that class will also. Would you talk about uh, counseling quote unquote non-sexual minority groups as well? Well, so that's the thing is that's all kind of up for debate. Right. Um, Commonly understood, you know, heterosexual couples will also be discussed. The class will focus on, um, LGB plus kink poly. And then um, we are still trying to figure out because uh, there's already a gender sp- class that exists in itself. Um, so if we're going to include working with folks from the trans community in that course or not, it's just a lot to cover in a class. Right. Um, so then the other class that we would strongly encourage um, or will be a part of the track will also be the gender class. So um, you're reworking the whole thing. In a way, I mean, we're like shuffling. Yeah. We're shuffling things around. So in other words, in the current class called Counseling Sexual Minorities, you might not talk about trans issues. You might move that to the gender Mm -hmm. course and focus uh, on counseling around sexual more orientation rather than gender. Right. If that makes sense. Like, Mm -hmm. so that class right now puts orientation and gender in the same course. And the gender course is the one taught in the CMHC program, correct? Yeah. So jury's out right now on what that's going to look like. Whether adopting Um, that or adding it or mm -hmm. something. Yeah. Yeah. And then you would add a fourth class. It would be a special topic. Sex therapy. Oh, it would be yeah. sex therapy. Mm-hmm. Sex therapy special topic? Uh, no. So sex therapy is in the process of becoming a regularly offered course to okay. twice a year. Okay. Um, and then the idea is, is just because if people haven't figured it out by now listening to this show today, it is so broad. So we just want to make sure that uh, that there are different kind of special topics being offered that are going to be more up to date with what the current issues might be. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. So, yeah, just commentary, and I'm sure you've heard a lot and thought a lot about it. The uh, sex and intimacy concentration would need that final class of just general sex therapy to kind of wrap it all up and Mm -hmm. make it applicable to everything because the other Mm -hmm. classes don't necessarily, well, I guess they kind of do. So right now what we're thinking is is that the electives that a student needs to take that they could easily slot in those sexuality focused ones and still meet their elective requirements. And so the specialized class would be the sex therapy class. Would be the extra one. Mm -hmm. Right. You're saying for people who don't understand what you're saying is that you don't have to, we have a certain amount of electives you can take in our, in our, in our degree. And 
you can use those electives to take classes in the sex and intimacy concentration. So you're not having to take extra classes, but there will be one extra class potentially in the final course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is totally fine. Um, that's always how we try to work our concentrations. They're generally four classes, one class each quarter, and we try to make it so that you can use some of the courses as electives. In the play therapy track, for example, you take four classes over the span of a year, and the first two classes can count towards your regular degree, so you're really only taking two extra classes. Um, so, yeah, interesting. Uh, what about alums, when they come back, they wouldn't have to take human sexuality again, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, and we're still figuring out those details. So like I said, the, the ideal is to make it a certification um, and then alums can come back and then also they can get um, financial aid for tuition. Um, but if it is just a concentration, then they would come back and just audit or take the class that they're interested in. Hmm. That makes sense. So... One question, and I don't know if this is a big topic or not, but when people, people back in the day, I remember there was this, there was talk when I was getting my master's in the mid nineties, the sort of simplistic talk around, there's different issues when you are talking to gay couples as opposed to straight couples. And, um, but as I started to practice, with actual gay couples, actual straight couples, I, I, over time, stopped distinguishing between the two groups mm. of people. I mean, obviously, there are th things about, around coming out. And like, you know, I had a couple who um, came out to each other secretly when they were very young. And uh, that was a very powerful moment for mm -hmm. them that really bonded them. And... Um, really one could argue sustained their, you know, several decades long relationship, you know, um, and added an element of protectiveness and like danger of the outside world and all that kind of stuff to uh, that relationship, which maybe helped them bond. I don't know. Um, so there, there's obviously differences, but over time I I've treated, you know, so many couples over the years and, um, you know, I don't have a different hat that I put on when I treat gay couples. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like love and intimacy, sexuality, um, uh, attachment, hurt feelings, conflict. It's all exactly the same. Like there's, there's no difference, you know, um, that one could generalize. Now, a particular gay couple might be very different from a particular heterosexual couple for mm -hmm. various reasons, whether it's, you know, related to sexual orientation or otherwise. Um, but, uh, I don't know. Am I making sense? At all? Yeah, you're making sense. Uh, so that, so I think things have changed a little bit. One of the criticisms of existing couples therapy models is that a lot of the research they're based on is looking primarily at heterosexual couples. And so the argument is, is if it's research-based, evidence-based um, models that you're applying to working with it and they're missing this population to be represented in their samples, that it's just there are nuances that you may not consider. Yeah. There also tend to be, and I think this is happening less and less, some gender stereotypes and stereotypical role assumptions in some of the couples work that we do or models that exist out there. Mm -hmm. um, and so that you know, the danger is not identifying one as the more feminine or masculine, you know, partner in the couple. Mm -hmm. um, what I see more that is something to attend to is um, the fact that the dominant narrative in same-sex couples' lives as they grow up is a heterosexual um, normative model. And so how do you... Um, help identify where that script doesn't serve them because it's based on um, not only heterosexual, but usually very traditional ideals. And so there's a strength in that, which is a lot of the same sex folks that I work with kind of have already done a lot of work out of identifying their own marital agreement or relationship agreement that fall outside of those norms. Um, but where you tend to see, you know, issues arising, which we see. And again, I would say a lot of our couples is that that dominant 
marital expectations agreement doesn't work for them. Right, exactly. Yeah. It would apply to heterosexual couples exactly, exactly as well, you know. Uh, it's a particular thing for gay couples because, um, you know, it doesn't map it doesn't map directly onto their you know lives but it affects them as you say um but i don't know i guess what i'm saying is like uh classes it must be kind of hard because it's like well um we need to educate people on all the different kinds of issues that you've Mm -hmm. you know the few that you've talked about so Mm -hmm. far could be expanded into a class but the idea that it's like, okay, now you're going to take this class on like how to treat these kinds of people and how they're so different from the other kinds of people you've been taught. To to me, it just doesn't really bear out when I actually talk to people, you know? You know, a lot of the things I feel like we've talked about today, and that's part of the reason of wanting to change the name of that course, um, is that, you know, if you have a really solid foundation in systems training or in therapy, then hopefully you're trained with the ability to adapt to the different people that are walking in your door. And that could be anything, right? Whether we're talking about sexuality or couples or addiction or anything. Play therapy is a good example you've been using. So I think that's where we have to be careful when we teach classes is, you know, on one hand, I want to say everything you're saying makes sense. And then on the other, I, I think that's, you know, that there are particular experiences from certain folks that um, it, to me is more cultural than anything else, mm-hmm. um, but it does show up in the work that we do. Yeah, maybe it's more, and, you know, totally tell me if I'm wrong about this, is that, f- for example, you take a white male, heterosexual, you know, raised Protestant guy. Cisgendered. Cisgender yeah. guy comes to uh, the program and doesn't have any experience experiences or friends or you know read any books or anything on a uh, transgender person getting married or something and having sex and so they've probably absorbed a lot of really negative um, or at least ignorant ideas around that person and their experience and without any kind of education around what that what not only um possible experiences those people commonly have, you know, because that's the other thing. Some people don't even have, even those people identify as trans um, will have different experiences, obviously. But, you know, there's some general things that you could say, or at least anecdotes, you know, maybe five different anecdotes to give you sort of an understanding of like what it's like for that person that for that male therapist, he's talking to clients and he has a trans couple and, um, can't necessarily know those people's story, but at the very least has a background of just like an understanding of like where that those, where those stories might lie. Mm-hmm. Whereas if a heterosexual, you know, cisgender couple comes in, he already has like so much experience in that world. He, he generally, now he can't transfer that knowledge onto that client for sure, but he kind of knows the general landscape of what's, what's likely, you know? Um, and maybe what questions to ask and that kind of thing and how to be welcoming and how to use language that makes people feel comfortable to talk about things. Is this making sense? Yeah. I, um, so I think that that kind of all the differences you're identifying in those two scenarios is what we teach, okay. right? Um, which so it's isn't, not teaching like how these people yeah. are so different with their no. attachment needs or how they they communicate with I statements in a totally different way. It's more mm-hmm. like understanding background and um, understanding um, the the cultural pocket that they lived in and all the things that sort of were imposed on them. Mm-hmm. Um, heterosexual cisgender males have things imposed on them too, uh, but they're just probably much more aware of those things because mm-hmm. they live through them and they're much more a part of the dominant understanding yeah. of our culture. So we teach that in a way that our therapists will be able to kind of meet the person that's sitting across from them, get to know those details, understand the pockets and identifiers. And then I think the things that we want to avoid are depending too heavily on our clients to teach us. Yeah. Um, and then also believing that there's some checklist out there that says like, oh, you have this type of person sitting across from you. Here are all the things that you need to do. Um, so those are the things we do not teach. What right. we do teach is a lot more of that kind of, you know, in between. Right. I yeah. mean, the thing the th- the thing I o- always come back to is wisdom. Mm-hmm. Uh, that you have to, you know, 
so you, again, you have this male, cisgender, heterosexual, Protestant raised guy, and he has a trans client who, you know, has various different identifiers that are different than his. And um, on one hand, he, if he just shows up completely blank and has no idea about the general kinds of experiences that someone has, he basically has to ask the client to tell him, to educate him on everything, um, which uh, can come across as very cumbersome to a client uh, and annoying. Uh, on the other hand, if the therapist sits down and says, I know your entire story because I've read a bunch of books. I've, I've taken you know, 10 years of classes on trans experience, and I know exactly what you've been through. I don't need to ask you any questions, right? So at that point, it's a different kind of a problem, right? So at some level, um, you have to be curious about every client. And at this, and another level, like um, you have to have some general idea of like where things might have been to give you some basis of trying to, you know, a pre-empathy, so to speak, mm -hmm. for somebody. And um, and in that Venn diagram is wisdom, is the ability to know, because there's no guideline. Uh, there are some clients that might actually really want to educate you on their experience and are totally fine with that, or it's really necessary given the scenario. Uh, there are other clients who don't, don't even want to talk about the fact that they're trans. <laughs> they're just like, I don't know, you know, I'm here to talk about other things. You know, mm -hmm. I've worked on this, in my, you know, I want to, and you know, let's just let's let's just not let's just not talk about that. You know, I'm I'm done talking about. It. I want to talk about um, my relationship with my mom or something. You know, and my mom's totally cool with me being trans or whatever. Um, so that trying to concretize or codify that in some sort of like prescription or guideline is impossible in my book because everything in therapy is that way. You have to absorb all the stuff and think and contemplate and experience and listen and can reflect and da 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 and out of that comes some sort of therapeutic wisdom that hopefully is helpful to other human beings there you go <laughs> <laughs> well that does it for that episode of psychology in seattle thanks for joining me fiona thanks for having I feel me like there's so many other things we could be talking about in fact we should have you back on the show another point if you will if this doesn't go too badly for you because someone actually emailed me and i think i emailed it to you or at least the topic about uh sexual pain pain mm -hmm. during pain during sex oh uh which actually would be like a whole other show. Right. Yeah. And I think you also asked me about like the um, kind of where this idea of sexual peak comes from. Right. Um, so there's uh, lots of questions out there. So maybe we can do something. We can collect some questions and see, see how far we can get. Yeah. So listeners out there, send me your questions to contact at psychology .com. You can email Fiona at Antioch. Would you like Antioch email? Sure, that might be hard for me to say on over the microphone, but I will try. It's faux feral. Uh huh. Faux feral. Because <laughs> we have no our apostrophe. <laughs> yeah, our first uh, initial, our first name, and then our last name, and so it's f o feral at antioch.edu. Yes. Do you have a website or anything? Yeah. So my practice is Adaptive Counseling Seattle. Hopefully, the Google machine. You just type that in there. It'll it'll send you right over to me. Adaptive Counseling Seattle. Uh, Gasworks Park, Wallingford area with a wonderful view. Do you set up your client couch to look out the window or? Well, it's hard to avoid the windows. I have two, like the half of the building or the corner corner. Kind of like so, this. Mm -hmm. um, but I do. And it has some pros and cons to it, which is the like the sun it's, can blast them sometimes. Maybe? Uh, well, I have like the blinds oh, okay. and adjust it. It's more that it can be really soothing. It's great because you can watch all the little cars going across the freeway and thinking, oh, I'm not in that traffic right now. <laughs> um, and you see boats going by. I've also had not one, but two birds fly into my windows. While um, you were in the office? Mm -hmm. Oh, yep. my god. Bald goodness. eagle sightings. Oh. A heron once. Did, are the birds okay? Uh, I believe so. <laughs> you know, it happens. Was there any blood or? No, nothing like that. Okay. Nothing like, just a little like startling more yeah. than anything else. Yeah. Um, and then the drawback is, is it can be really distracting for people who want to be distracted. Oh. Uh, so sometimes it can, you know, we're all sitting there and then, you know, a, a bald eagle will be flying by and there's no way somebody's not stopping and going, I'm sorry, a bald eagle is flying behind your head right now. So, and you're just like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, I could see that's interesting. I mean, my, my window doesn't have any kind of thing like that, but, um, but I find that, I just figure like clients want to look out a window mm -hmm. or something, you know, 
Um, but yeah, I could see that going both ways. I'm, as I said, I'm moving my office, home office, and uh, the wind, I'm trying to figure that whole window situation out. You know, because you just think about as a client, you come, you know, weekly or every other week for an hour and, and you you stare at your client's face and you also kind of look behind your client's mm-hmm. head or your therapist's head. And, you know, it's just interesting to think about what you're what you're doing to your clients in terms of is it yeah. a blank wall? Is it a weird, um, you know, back in the day when I first became a therapist, I have no idea why. But I bought a um, Escher painting. You know, Escher, it's like that sketch, uh, sort of weird mathematical patterns and stuff, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And I, I bought one of those because it came framed and I put it behind my head because I just thought it had sort of a psychological element to it, you know? Okay, yeah. But, you know, God, who, you know. Um, I also bought my very first plant when I became a therapist. I was a 26. 26- Is it still alive? Uh, it might be. Um, I gave it away, but I had it for a long time and it got real big. Good sign. Yeah. It was that very standard office plant. I think they call it orange, an orange bush. You've seen it everywhere. It has, uh, uh, you know, green (laughs) leaves that like in a star pattern, but it's usually like eight or something and very, uh, clean looking plant. Anyway. Uh, I had that. I even think I took a sprig off and like planted it and it like started growing in another Mm. thing. Anyway, boring talk. Uh, Thanks for joining me, Fiona and uh, Adaptive Therapy Seattle. Adaptive Adaptive Counseling. Adaptive Counseling Seattle. Mm -hmm. uh, And you can send us your questions. You're going to have, we're going to have to back, back on the podcast to talk about because the, um, you know, pain and sex is a whole, it branches out in a whole other area around communication, around um, anatomy and, um, trauma and mm-hmm. you know just a lot of different things mm-hmm. that um, m- might be factors might not be but anyway so we'll talk about it another time great thanks for joining us out there please take care of yourself because you deserve it you really really do